My name is Jefferson Goddard. I'm the curator here. I've been in Salina for three months. I'll, as of this Friday, I'll be here for three months. <laughs> and I've had some wonderful experiences thus far. Uh, this show was originally created by Gretchen William uh, and worked on by Ruth Boyce. And I've taken it over. And it's contemporary textile. The show that is part of this Lunch and Learn. So as you probably already know, we do a Lunch and Learn here at Salina Art Center every third Wednesday. And today we have a wonderful opportunity to talk to our local community and bring in clothing. So one of the things that I brought into the show, which is contemporary textiles, was uh, Misty and I both, Misty, Surrey, and director, and I both talked about how assessing the local community also can get quilting, but also the fact that quilting is part of the dialogue of fiber arts. So we wouldn't really have such a robust discussion, you know, post 20th century in fiber arts if it weren't for quilters. Uh, quilting, it's part of, uh, I'm going to go through some slides very quickly and talk about the history of quilting as I'm going to do that right now. Uh, and then I'll introduce the speakers and we'll have a robust discussion. Uh, what is quilting? Quilting is essentially, base of quilting is two layers of fabric with some kind of batting in between, which is stitched, both hand and machine stitched. All the quilts that are on our show are hand, are machine stitched. So I know the is going to talk a little bit about that today. Uh, this is the first known you know, quilt. So 14th century Sicily, uh, the Normans occupied Sicily. And this is a story of Tristan and Isolde, who Tristan was a knight and had an adulterous affair uh, with the princess of Scotland. I'm sorry, Irish princess Isolde. Uh, and there's many different names for Tristan and Isolde, but I'm sticking with Tristan and Isolde because there's awkward and valley after them, so, you know. Uh, <laughs> but they finally escaped to the wilderness and got married and were able to elope and, and finish their love. But this is the quote that talks about that story. Here's a little detail of uh, one of these quotes. Uh, this is, it's called uh, Tripunto, uh, the technique. Is, are you familiar with this guy? Okay, yes. yeah. Tripunto to the expert. Obviously, uh, by inserting rolls of cotton into raised section of the design. So this is in the collection of the uh, of the Victorian Albert Museum in London. So this quote actually. Uh, then we have Harriet Powers, who uh, is a fiber is is a is a self taught artist, but also an emancipated slave. Uh, she worked uh, most of the 18th century. She died in the early part of the 19th century. There's only two quotes of hers. I'm just going to quickly go over a couple panels real fast. The, uh, the first row on the top right here. Uh, this is, this is uh, Joe praying for his enemies. So they're both biblical and celestial happenings. And uh, the second row, the this one right here was important uh, three years before her birth. On 1833, there was a, a meteor shower, and a lot of people in, uh, thought that in the South thought that the world was coming to an end. So she marked this by that. And then finally, uh, this is there's a lot of Noah's Ark, and uh, the creation of animals continues, and that's right there. So both celestial and biblical, and uh, Harriet Powers uh, was educated through this. A Red Cross benefit quote, this is from Virginia, and there's 785 days here called Fundraise for World War I in response to Woodward Wilson's Every American Can See It to do something. Uh, this is the Names Project, and of course there's hundreds of quotes, right, important quotes. These are just a few historic moments. Uh, the AIDS Memorial Quilt, which was started in 1987, uh, which was, sorry, I just want to get the dates right. right here. That's fine. By 2016, it, this is the National Mall in DC, and the, uh, the quilt spans over 1.2 million square feet. So it's quite enormous. And yeah, and it's over 100,000 names. Anyway, you can say minutes after all, right? Uh, this is G's Bend, which is a rural community in Alabama. And the interesting thing is it's north of Selma. Uh, actually, Sean turned me on to this mm -hmm. as well, and we have had discussions about this. This was a, this is a group of 20th century quilters, but the 
interesting about Jeeves Bend, it was named after the slave owner that owned the plantation, uh, which was a normal custom in the, in the, in the uh, 19th century. Uh, but they allowed, the government actually allowed for a lot of African American peoples to own by property, by tracts of land at that time. So actually the Jeeves Bend area was actually owned for part of the 20th century, which, you know, they escaped the Jim Crow sort of, you know, uh, hole, if you will, or that, that issue we had with allowing to own property. On the, the quilts, it had been shown in many museum exhibitions. And then finally, uh, we're going to talk a little bit, I mean, we've got a quilting key here right now. We're not going to quilt today, but we've got a quilting key here. So before I introduce our speakers, just very quickly, Faith Rangel is a living artist who's living with us, who often uses quilts and writes wonderful children's books. So if you have grandchildren or children, we encourage you to look at her books. This is actually not a quilt, but it's a quilting bee. And uh, these are these are some, uh, this is uh, Madame Walker, Sojourner Truth, from left to right. Ida Wells, Fanny Lou Hammer, Harriet Tubman, Rosa Parks, Mary McLeod, Mary McLeod Bethune, and Ella Baker. And then on the right, it's not a uh, Van Gogh, but it's a stand-in, it's a fictional character that she created, so. Um, With sunflowers, like Van Gogh? Yeah, so this is called, this is called uh, Quilting Bee at Arla. So Arla is a French town where, where a lot of Impressionism and post-Impressionist painters worked. So this was her nod to that community. So, without much further ado, I am thrilled to introduce our panelists. Uh, and they sat alphabetically as well. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> stitches are regular, quilters follow the rhythm of the fabric, so that's great. So, Sean Marie Delker, we have Liddell Edgar, and we have Catherine Kearney. Uh, they're all Salina based quilters and artists. Charmaine uh, Delford, they're all three in our contemporary technical show. And we're all going to have a rich discussion. I have some images up. They actually also brought quilts graciously. So we're going to talk about that. Uh, yes, there's social distancing in place, but please, you're welcome to come up and look at this. And uh, I'm going to go through some slides, but feel free to, you know, we've got some wonderful moments here. Some wonderful to talk about. I'm going to start with Sean Marie Delper and have some images up. You're welcome to talk about what you're Okay. Okay. Can everybody hear me okay with the mask on? Okay. Uh, I will try. And if you can't, raise your hand and I'll pull off the mask and hopefully you'll be able to hear. Um, I am Sean Delper. I am, uh, I used to do traditional quilts like are showing up here. And that's my very first one that I ever did. It's all hand pieced. And uh, uh, so I and I sat there and stitched on it when my son, who's now in his 40s, uh, was a baby. So that one was stitched out of old pieces of shirts and leftover pieces of fabric. And so that was where. That was where that one was, and it had, it's called a Boston Comic Quilt. And I put prairie points all the way around the edge. And yes, it's made out of polyester, and it's not cotton. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I was following the rules at that time. And then this one is one of my later quilts. I finished that two or three years ago. And I call it my second chances quilt. And because I practice so much and do so many pieces of quilt, I have a lot of failures. But people don't believe that, that I have lots and lots of failure quilts, or even ones that I wanted to see if this worked, and it doesn't, and then I have this, and I don't really want to throw it in the trash. So I cut up my failure quilts, into three inch squares, two inch squares, and one inch squares, stacked them up, and hand stitched around each one using the, the buttonhole stitch around each one, and then stuck it on, the, on a piece of fabric and stitched between each one, and I have that hanging up 
in my hallway of my home to remind me that we all need second chances. And <laughs> so I gave those quilts a second chance. So, and I enjoy doing stuff like that. I'm working on my next one that's all circles instead of squares. So I enjoy doing things like that. Um, hey, thanks to the next one. Oh, thank you. Well, both of these are mine, and both of them are log cabins. I chose the log cabin to show what a wonderful, versatile pattern a log cabin quilt is. I've even seen them done wonky, which is really fun to look at, too. But these are traditional log cabin quilts. That, uh, that they are so very different depending on how you set up the pattern. They're very, very different. The colors are very, very different. The blue one sits in a bed, uh, is on a bed in the, in the bedroom where my children, when they come visit and use that on that particular bed. So it's my guest bed. And uh, the red one is much smaller than that and it hangs on the back of one of my chairs. So, um, but now I am no longer doing very much of the traditional quilting. I find that the confines of little squares and matching points just isn't for me. Um, although I enjoy doing it and I know what to do and I know the tricks. Some of them, I don't know all of them. I know a lot of the tricks. I'm even qualified to judge quilts and at fairs and stuff, but I really don't like doing it because I feel like I'm a member of that quilt police <laughs> that many of you have heard about. And so I have moved on to doing art quilts and this is more like what I am doing now. I have no points to match and I've been doing, this is eco-printed, I enjoy or, or sometimes called botanical printing. And then a piece of self on the back to be the moon, and then I thread painted um, the bird. And uh, thread painting is when it's just like taking watercolor paints. In fact, I've been taking watercolor paint classes to learn more about how to shade and that sort of thing. So that's what I've been doing and working on recently with my art. I just love doing it, and I have a lot of fun with it. Uh, sometimes the thread painting does, does get tedious because I'm at the sewing machine just sitting and making tiny little movements to, to do that. So it does take a lot of time. But I wanted to tell one story about why I don't like being the quilt police and, and maybe I hope I don't step on any toes from somebody else that's in the quilt police. But <laughs> because there's a lot of them out there that believe this has got to be exact. And one time I was teaching a class to a young lady, uh, to a group of young ladies that were much younger than me. And they were, uh, one lady said, I have a quilt. It is beautiful. She was very emphatic about it. So in my mind, I envisioned something like what you guys have made in the past, or some of my quilts that I've made that I think are quite nice. And then she brought it to the next session of the class. And um, it was the most gosh awful ugly thing you ever saw in your entire life. I am not kidding. Her mother and her grandmother had taken a blanket, threw a sheet on top of it flat. I don't know how they had put it together. It was an old blanket, crummy old blanket, you know, with the pills on it and everything. A sheet, an old sheet that had been used over and over again, and they had that kind of funny smell to them when they'd been stored too long. <laughs> then she had taken, then they had taken overalls and shirts and I just plastered on with a big zigzag stitch all the way around each piece of clothing. And I thought, oh my word, this wouldn't even pass for a quilt at the fair. You can't take this to the fair. They, they'd even go, this 
They need me to go, no, no. Well, but she kept telling me, isn't this beautiful? And I'm going, uh-huh. And I have this smile on my face, like a doubtful look. And then she spread it all out and said, see, these overalls were my daddy's overalls. And, and I remember my dad when I looked at them. And look, they left the pocket so I can put secret things in it. And, and look, this little onesie belonged to my niece. She's all grown out of it now, but I like to remember her. Look, this is my grandma's old house dress she used to wear around the house all the time. And it has a pocket and I can stick things in it. And she taught me a big lesson that day that, that I don't even really like judging quilts anymore because every quilt has something special about it. It did, I didn't like it. I wouldn't want it on my bed, but she will have it on her bed for the rest of her life, I'm sure, because of what it meant to her. It was grandma's dress and daddy's overalls and niece's clothes, and uh, it was special to her. So I wanted to leave you with that, that I just feel like that, uh, that, that these quilts in here are beautiful. They're awesome. But, um, Sometimes it's in the eye of the people. And actually, just one last slide mm -hmm. of Sean's work. Oh, this is a pinwheel, and correct me if I'm wrong, and a bow tie. Yes, that's a pinwheel. And if you look at it, actually, I'm new to the quilting, you know, <laughs> educational quilting, which is governed by these three lovely people here, and Jean Hamilton. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's wonderful to learn so much about these. But you can actually see on the right, like the bow tie. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, I brushed those very, very quickly out, and they're all machine quilted and machine pieced. But I machine quilted them myself. I didn't send it out to somebody else. And uh, next, we have some images of some of the Dell editors, and also we're right here. I'd like to start with this one because I pulled this out of my. Um, well, I had to find it this morning, this month, and I was a little nervous about finding it. Um, I want to talk about quilting in community, because this quilt represents community to me. Um, years ago, I was in a group that met religiously uh, monthly. There were 12 of us, and all ages, and we had... We would come together on a Monday night and we would laugh and we'd always have something to eat, but we'd always have handwork that we would do and quilting that we would, you know, have available. They knew about my children. I knew about theirs. I knew about their grandchildren. It was a community. And, I, and again, getting back to, you know, quilting bees, that's what that was. It was building community. Um, we decided that we were all going to make four patches. So four patches is two uh, colored uh, fabrics and then usually then two offsetting, either muslin or something. So we each made what seemed like hundreds of four patches because each of us then gave the other 11 probably a a, a stack of a dozen and then I got other four patches from my friends. So this quilt represents my community of friends. Now I have to tell you some of these ladies are no longer here but I remember them and they were very special in my life. And so quilting um, and I also said early on this is the one and only quilt that I have hand quilted, and it will be remain the only <laughs> hand quilted quilt that I have made. So again, um, and it probably took me about 15 years to get it quilted. So, um, but it's very special. And again, it just shows uh, how much um, community uh, community gatherings. In fact, Catherine and I went to. Um, Sisters Oregon several years ago, and the G's Benz women were there, 
And they sang. And they sang, and it was amazing. <laughs> they showed their quilts, and um, it, it was an amazing experience. But again, that was, we were about 15 women or so from North Central Kansas that went to. Huh? I thought it was whole bus full, but well, it was an old <laughs> Or so. Yeah. Um, so. I put it back on oh, that quickly. Did you yeah. See that? yeah. That's a nine patch, actually. Mm -hmm. Right? In the center is a nine patch, yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's got a piece of it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The rest of it come more like a round pen. So, a couple of things. I actually do a lot of hand um, piecing in terms of uh, applique, and mm -hmm. this is with wool. And I tell you what, um, this is all cotton, and it feels very different than the green quilt um, because it has a, it, it, well, I don't know how to explain how wool feels. It's, you know, it isn't a wool jacket, but it is a textured uh, piece of fabric. And so it's easy then to applique wool because it is a little more dense than what cotton is. And it's built in wool. And it's built in wool, yeah. So it, it just, and it's so cuff, comforting to sit and stitch it. And it, I use a, a, a blanket stitch mostly to put it down. And then I, I um, can do some embroidery to make it kind of pop. Um, the first quilt there I made in honor of a good friend that just passed away uh, and she had an art show um, in her memory. And that quilt is special because it, I call it intersecting lives because this woman and I had young children the same age. We met at um, a YWCA that brought people together. Our husbands um, were both in the, um, either the architectural or the contractor uh, uh, business, and so we had numerous ways, our children, our uh, social life at a YWCA, and then our husbands, so it was, I really felt like we intersected in a variety of ways. Uh, you wanna, um, the pink and brown quilt, again, I, I still am in the, um, I don't judge people's quilts though, but I really love machine piecing. And so um, I do a lot of that now. I, I probably spend anywhere from three to four hours a day sewing and piecing. Um, and so uh, it fills my spirit with, it's, it's my artistic uh, out, um, outlet. Uh, I can, Again, to, <laughs> I can start something and go, oh, that did not work, and just throw it <laughs> over my shoulder and start something else. So um, uh, I believe that, well, and then I believe quilts also then keep you warm. And so it's a, it's, um, it's a nice way to um, think about, these things will last. And so I'll hand them down or they'll go to my grandkids or whatever. So I think that's about enough that I have to say. Oh, and then a fun watermelon quilt, again, pieced and a little uh, applique. So oh, just, just a few quilts to show you what I do. The is that actually is, called a watermelon pattern? That is a water. Oh, actually, the center is, oh goodness, um, snowball. Snowball. Mm -hmm. um, snowball. Snowball. The pink and brown on the corner is, um, again, all cotton. And I was doing just a little research. The pink and brown quilts came into vogue in the early 1800s. And so there was, there's a lot of history using pink and brown together, which some people would say, ooh, that, that's kind of unusual. And that's not a great photo, but um, I do love pink and brown, so definitely. Thank you. <laughs> um, yes, I am Catherine Kearney, and to me, quilting has a lot to do with color. Mm -hmm. I love color, and I love playing with color. 
And so the, it's amazing the things that you can do when you are just playing with color. The quilt that's on the right, it, it's better if you can even see the back. That's called mirror manipulation. And it's taking a particular motif within a fabric and repeating it. You cut the very same motif. So you end up with a piece of fabric that looks like Swiss cheese because you're just cutting out parts. And then when you put it together, you get a kaleidoscope effect. That kind of morphed into something that was called stack and whack because you could lay them in layers and cut it all at once. But stack and whack, you can't control the design that you want. Whereas with mirror manipulation, you can actually select the exact motif that you want to cut. And so I, have, I did a, a bunch of those. I love playing with color and fabric designs. And the other one is just simply what you can do when you make the same block and you just keep putting it together and how you can make a really strange, interesting look. The one that's, I don't remember what you have next. The one that's on the left was another one where you're playing with color and you sim it's simply a piece of fabric behind and then black on top and you can move it by their three dimensional so you can move it and it's a color thing again it's color I have to think about it. the one that this is a, a just a large piece of the one that's in this gallery that quilt I was just I had more fun making that than I can say because I went through all of my drawers of scraps and kept pulling things out and auditioning different fabrics with different fabrics. Mm -hmm. And then the secondary pattern that shows up mm -hmm. because it's just simply two different, well, there's three different blocks in that. Mm -hmm. And the way you put it together, you get this secondary pattern, mm -hmm. which again is about color and pattern. And that's the part that I like about quilting. And I just have so much fun with that. And one of the things I have learned, and Sean is absolutely right, I have learned in my business, I have a business called Quilting Station, and I do machine quilting for other people. Everybody has different likes and dislikes, but I learned early on I never say anything critical about their quilts. <laughs> I always give them positive feedback. At the end, if there's been an issue, one of the biggest issues that people have is they don't measure for their borders, they just sew them on. Mm -hmm. And then the borders are quite big for the center of the quilt. And I will say, if you want to have a better finished product next time, you might consider. Mm -hmm. And I try to give them positive feedback. But I have had several people who have brought in quilts that I wasn't sure I was going to even be able to quilt them because they were so wonky <laughs> and the, that I didn't know if I could get them flat and I just always told them I'll do the best I can but you realize that we have these issues and I'll just do the best that I can because I know this is a special quilt to you. So it's a, a good lesson to, to be aware that everybody has different likes mm -hmm. and although I like points to come to a point, they don't have <laughs> the, and the next one, I forget what you brought, what I did. The one on the left is this quilt. And the thing that is the neatest about this quilt, there's only two different fabrics in the whole quilt. But in the last, what, two or three years, we've come up with ombre fabrics. Is that about how long? Probably. And ombre shades from light to dark. And generally, it's dark on the salvage edges and lighter in the center. And by putting it together into a circle and then just following the cutting instructions, you can do amazing things. This is a Bargello quilt. Bargello quilts are simply, you put it and make a circle and then you cut strips and then you put it together. It's, it's easy to do, it sounds complicated, but it's easy to do. So it's just amazing, again, what you can do with color and fabric. Disagree. <laughs> oh, I love Barcellos. <laughs> oh, sorry. Not my mind. The other one um, is, again, playing with my scraps and putting color together. And that picture doesn't do justice to the color, but that's the way life is. One of the things that I brought, if you're interested in, in quilt blocks and designs, this book, Carrie Hall Blocks, this one, um, there's over 800 historical patterns. It was by Bat 
Christina Havig, and I don't even know if either of these are still available, but I think they might have this one in the library. This is one from the 1970s. It's kind of when I began getting interested in quilting. And it has a number of block patterns and designs in it, too. And I use these as reference tools. <laughs> I have more pattern books than I know what to do with, but I did, I still go to these. So I brought those along in case anybody would be interested in looking at those. And I would ask if you have questions for the three of us. Definitely. Is Kansas a big quilting state? Yes, but I don't think it's any bigger than anywhere else. What do you think? You the, know, wherever I travel, there's lots of quilters yeah. and lots of quilt fields. And there are quilt shops That's everywhere. That's where I was going to go. Except here but the, thing, yeah. the thing that is really shocking, and they'll, they'll agree with me, you can go to a different, to even a different town here. You can go to Abilene or you can go to Minneapolis and go into those shops and they're totally different. Yep. Different attitude about their color choices, whether they're focusing on one type of fabric or not. And then if you go to Colorado, they're really more into art quilting. Mm -hmm. In my area of Colorado, it's not traditional quilting at all. So, and then another area, it's all dark fabrics, and you go somewhere else, and it's all beach fabrics, and so it's, it's not any more here than anywhere else, what you guys said. I agree. Yeah, I do. Just different. Just different. Mm -hmm. and, but I do miss the quilt shop in Salina. <laughs> Yeah, I have a question for Liddell. I'm not worked with wool at all. When you applique, do you turn under or is no. it off? It's just the, the like it's, it's stitched. So it mm -hmm. doesn't uh, exactly. Okay. Yeah. It's it's lovely to work with and that blanket stitch is easy to do. And then, you know, add whatever embroidery you want afterwards. So it's I do a lot of the wool work in the winter. Because again, it's so comforting and warm, and um, it, it's easy to do. Do you buy it felted or do you? Yes, do I do. Yourself? No, I don't. Are you all aware of what felted wool is? In case not, it's wool that has been shrunk to within an inch of its life. I mean, <laughs> you buy, if you buy a piece of wool, then you wash it in as hot a water as you can wash it in. And you put it in the dryer on as high a heat as you can possibly do it, and it draws it all together, and it doesn't ravel. No, it doesn't. No. Sometimes it's called boiled wool. Yes. Yes. Sean, mm -hmm. uh, have, been, have you done any uh, of the Kawandi or CD quilts? Mm -hmm. I've been researching this, and it is this Margaret, starts the F, uh, she went to India. And in India, during the 16th, 17th century, uh, black slaves would take brought into India, and they didn't have very much material, so they used uh, saris, and uh, they blankets for the monsoon season. Mm -hmm. And so they would hand stitch scraps with a hand stitch. Mm -hmm. And so I've been looking at this on Pinterest, so I made me a couple in the last two weeks. Oh, cool! <laughs> and uh, so you use a large thread and you just take scraps on your scrap bag uh -huh. and start uh, you put your layer of your background material that you're batting and then you start adding from the outside in and hand stitch this in and uh, so research it because it is also called uh, slow stitching where Does you it meditate, it? kind of, yeah. and you know, do the stitching. Or CD, S-I-D-D-I, or Kawandi, K-W-A-N-D-I. Mm -hmm. So with the COVID, I've just been like sitting in my recliner, <laughs> and my step bag next to me, and then just grab and set and stitch. And, uh, but it's a lot of hand mm -hmm. and pushing that needle through. But this lady mm -hmm. uh, that went to do, she would go to India and research. Uh, and bring these back, and then they would have shows about them. So yeah. it's very interesting. You might check it out. Thank you. Uh -huh. I've heard about camp, camp, oh, one, uh, camp, 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 which is uh -huh. like one piece of fabric with little tiny stitches.
is across the road. Right, and then the Japanese have like, you and know, And they have, bo they have Boro oh, and they have Zemeth. So that's the S, uh, mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, yeah, yeah, and then there's more yeah. exact ones that's, right. that's um, got a different name. So anyway, so if it's wonky or you've got mm -hmm. a thread or a knot and it's crooked and it's art. Yes, <laughs> that's exactly right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah.
because you can only get about half of it rolled under your, the arm of your machine anyway. And if you have a really big quilt, put a table on the other side of your sewing machine. So the weight goes onto that table. It's not dropping down and pulling on the weight on your shoulder because the other part even goes up over your shoulder. And it's oh heavy. It, it's oh, heavy. Let's bring it to you at that point. You are welcome, Sarah, to bring it to me. <laughs> <laughs> I think most people chose, choose to do that just because it isn't easy to do it on your domestic. But it can be done. And I've seen beautiful quotes oh, done yeah, on the exactly. domestic. Yeah, definitely, yes. Beautiful quotes. <laughs> so there's not a reason you couldn't do it. <laughs> Now you guys, you and Ian have a machine now, don't you? We do. Oh, beautiful. Yeah. Oh, good. Because I look back here, I recognize that. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. What other questions? Ellie? Yeah. I just want to know, do you, um, when you're, when you're trying your quill out, do you like to sketch? Do you get colored pencils or do it on paper or do you, do you for me, I just have a design wall and I have this idea in my head and I just try until I like it. Uh, sometimes I'm right and sometimes I'm wrong. <laughs> but that's how I do it. I, yeah. I I'm one of the quilters that design it all out for us. Yeah, no, I don't. I'm more spontaneous. I do like, mm -hmm. I have a de design wall. Uh -huh. and it, you know, I can slap things up there and say, oh, that's not going to work. And, you know, so. and I'm the same. And, it's, and, oh. and you don't use the computer either, like computer design program? No, no I, if I had a decent computer and I was illiterate in computer <laughs> yes. days, I probably would, but no. So that's a so what's on the surface of the wall? Felt. 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 And then or flannel. Mine is a flannel sheet that I have wrapped around the board, and it's, it's the height of a wall, a flannel. And then in, I have another one in my house in Estes Park, and it's the back side of a plastic tablecloth. Table and, it's, yep. you know, yep. it and I just have it tacked to the wall. And, and then the fabric will just sort of stick to it. The fabric sticks to it. And do you ever take pictures of it with your phone? So oh, you oh, all, all the time. Oh. Side by side, so then it is you have way more. The other part about taking pictures of it with your phone is if you get your blocks all done and you have them arranged, mm -hmm. take a picture of it with your phone, and then you can see if you have one block turned the wrong way, because it'll show up in that little picture, but you won't see it on the wall. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a mix of old school and, and yeah. technology. Yep. Yeah, that's a great question. I, I'm curious, actually, myself, how you feel about people, you know, you said your, your family comes and uses in the guest bedroom, the quilts. Mm -hmm. Does that mean they actually sleep with the quilts? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Always. Y'all comfortable with that? Oh, yeah. The oh, only thing that bothers me the most is when they take them and use it for the dogs or cats. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I uh, but my cat sleeps on my quilts all the time, so. Mm -hmm. But yes, quilts are meant to be used. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah actually, speaking of usefulness factor, one of our panelists actually was featured in 1989 in Bloomingdale's on Lexington and 3rd in New York, not online, this is pre-digital, it's actually the physical headquarters of Bloomingdale's, if it's still in business, I think it is. Anyway, uh, what kind of experience did you have with that? Because we never really talked about it, you mentioned it to me, and I was fascinated by that because, you know, when you're on this national stage, right, of that effect, did you actually go there and no, see the... No, I didn't. Um, that was when I was in my phase of just doing miniatures. Mm -hmm. And so I wouldn't have taken a quilt this size and let them have it at Bloomingdale's because um, A, it would be cost prohibitive to ship 20 of these uh, and then not know whether you're gonna sell any. So I probably sent about 15 or 20 miniature quilts to Bloomingdale's um, and just hoped for the best. I, and I did sell some. Um, so uh, it was kind of an experiment of whether um, metropolitan folks would know what a quilt was. And so I just, I just gave it a try. So, um, but I moved past that. I, I don't do that anymore. <laughs>
And as, as Catherine Richard chairs the Cool Things Station mm -hmm. here, and Sean teaches, obviously, and does thread painting. Um, in fact, uh, the exhibit here, which uh, if we have a few minutes, maybe we can walk around mm -hmm. in near the end and show the works of these lovely, talented panelists here. Uh, do we have any more questions, though? I have more of a comment that um, when you were describing how the quilts should be used and also just the comfort of them, Sean, when you were talking about the special things that were in that woman's quilt uh, that were so meaningful, and then uh, we were talking about art and quilting and community. And it reminded me of the AIDS quilt project that was just so phenomenal that brought people together from when you showed it earlier. I mean, what a beautiful thing. And I just love that so many people got involved in um, expressing their love through quilt scenes and what a, what a feeling activity that was for uh, the entire nation. You know, it was pretty phenomenal. If there's over 100,000 names in here, and uh, the pandemic actually at that time, mm -hmm. the AIDS well, pandemic. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Did you, did, were you able to see, going back very quickly, did you, if you had any communication with anybody in the area? Well, there was also something no. I wanted to talk with you. Um, I had a, a, a um, oh, I don't even remember what they were. It was a, a couple, a man and wife, that kind of shepherd the quilts through the process. And so, but I didn't go. So, okay. I was curious. so they, they um, were there in, in New York and um, helped to arrange them and do that sort of stuff. Because someone over here asked about quilting in Kansas, yeah. right, and how popular it is. And I come from grandmothers who quilted and in South Carolina, Georgia, I'm from Florida, but I thought quilting was a southern thing growing up. And then to learn that it's quite pervasive throughout the world, obviously. Uh, and, and quilting's early roots prior to the bed quilt, I wanted to start there. But quilting was actually a technique that's been used for centuries. And early Mongolian warriors would use it to actually warm them up under their armaments. So it was actually used in battle. Quilting's you know, cool things quite dexterous, tough material. <laughs> what I had been doing was mm -hmm. intuitive piecing, yeah. and I had learned how to do that. And and I everything was always in squares mm -hmm. and rectangles. I wanted to try triangles. Oh yeah. So that's everything's a triangle in there. And I started putting those pieces together, and then I started laying them out, and I decided, boring, too, too busy. So I put it up on my design wall, and so suddenly thought, I got this beautiful piece of blue silk that is absolutely gorgeous piece of blue silk. And I just then I started put, just playing it together, and that's how it all came together. Mm -hmm. Then when I quilted it, I'd already had the ribbon quilted. So I didn't put that on the actual thing. It's, I don't think. And then I took each, then when I decided to quilt the whole thing, I put really close stitching close to the ribbon and it got further and further away mm -hmm. to give it more depth and stuff. So that's, yeah. it's, a, it's been so long ago, I don't remember exactly how I did it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> It's got so many dimensions in it, you know, like the, mm -hmm. I think there's the dimension of time and, mm -hmm. you know, I think mm -hmm. one of the, you know, so it's really, like when you talk about how you put that together, mm -hmm. that's amazing to, to think about. And, it, and I was thinking of ice and cracked ice and mm -hmm. cold and, and, but it just looked so chaotic, I had to do something to it. It's called the eye of the storm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.